In the world of luxury goods, both France and Germany boast no figure that comes quite as close to a living national icon as Karl Lagerfeld. He is best known as head designer and creative director for both the House of Chanel and the Italian fashion brand Fendi, and he enjoys great success with his own Karl Lagerfeld label. Born in Hamburg, he has been a fixture on the Paris fashion scene for over 50 years. If ever two nations had a private sector soft power asset at the centre of the creative industries, it's the man in the skinny denim, frockish coat, pulled back hair and sunglasses. I met with Mr. Lagerfeld in Paris at his bookstore, Come Atelier, Come Photo Studio, to discuss everything from fine print, politics and creative control. In 89, 90, I think when we might have, what might have met, uh, we were in a period of five or six sort of singular women, um, many fashion houses, uh, not attached to big corporates. Was there a different, a different sense of, of doing business, a different sense of marketing uh, then versus now, or, or do you think? Marketing is a word I never use because I don't know what that means. Huh? Good, let's forget about it. I don't have to do that. Huh? Uh, Lucky you. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, uh, I think about what I want to do. And when I think I found a good solution, I don't discuss it with marketing people. Huh? I do it huh? because if not, forget about it. Huh? No. It's, it's another world, you know, in, in 25 years the world has changed unbelievably. With stupid things like the, the iPad and the, and, and the iPhone already that changed the world too. And internet and all, the, 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 all those things, I mean, the world is so different. Uh, people connect in such a different way. The business is also, look, Amazon or those things didn't exist, so you can not compare anymore. For me, it's like it happened 50 or 100 years ago. Mm. It's interesting that you maybe refer to them in, in a slightly dismissive way. Uh, and in a way, I applaud this as well. You recently brought out uh, a newspaper, yeah. uh, which was interesting to see. A provocation, uh, just to say, listen, there are many ways to consume media. There's many ways to advertise and promote. Or I love paper. I love newspapers. I think it was fun to do. It was not done like this before. Uh, you know, I worked... Uh, for one day with papers like Metro, what was like mine, or I did Liberation, I did Welt am Sonntag. I like that, so why shouldn't I do, not do it one day for myself? Does that maybe reflect also what your breakfast diet looks like? Are you a Frankfurter Allgemeine, Neue Zürcher Zeitung, yeah. Le Monde, uh, yes, New York yeah, Times? Yes, no, you don't have the Monde for the breakfast, it comes out at, at lunchtime. If you have the Monde for breakfast, it's an old magazine, an old paper, it's from the day before. Huh? It, it's the only uh, noon paper. Huh? But it's a good thing, because very often they have things the other don't have because they finish before midnight. Huh? So in the no, I love daily papers. I mean, uh, but some of them have problems because they're not well written. I think the survival of daily papers depends a lot on the way people write. There are not many great, what they used to call feathers, huh? plume. And that makes it more banal. Because the language on, on the digital and all this is another thing. That is information. But on a paper, you want to sit down, read, and read something was pleasant to read. Mm. Not just flat information, you can get that somewhere else. They it, have to make a bigger effort. It's interesting listening to the press barons. They're always blaming it's digital's fault. Uh, it's no, the fault it's of their new fault. Also, you know, if they were geniuses with a new modern way to write like it used to happen in the past, but that doesn't exist. Mm. Uh, it's easily pretentious and. Uh, it's not much better than the information on the digital, I'm sorry. So then I understand that there are problems. It's very interesting to look at Die Zeit right now, a newspaper which is actually growing. Uh, everyone says a print is dead. Yes, but also the level is better. Of course, I absolutely. Mean, uh, uh, the Zeit I read, I love the Zeit. Huh? The Zeit magazine sometimes is a little too pretentious for me. Huh? I prefer the magazine from the Frankfurt uh, once a month. You know, they did eight times a month in the first year not because of my cartoons, huh? my caricature. Now, from next year, they're doing so well, they do every month. But what's in the DNA, do you think, in, in the German market that they've been able to sustain this? I think it's also the fact that there are many different cities. It's not only one big city and the rest is Sleeping Beauty. I think there is something more complicated and more uh, diversified in Germany than in other countries. Because it's polycentric? Yes. The power is not just sitting in Berlin, it's, it's exactly. not just... No, no, Berlin, no. <laughs> what, is, what is your take on Berlin? But you know, Berlin could be great, but for me, Berlin is a, like a human body with an arm and a leg missing. What they did there, the Russians, made it forever 
something what has not the soul Berlin was famous for. It's okay, they want to be trendy, they want to be so trendy that they look sometimes like a second grade London. Uh, that's not that easy. Uh, for me, I know so well the past of Berlin and the spirit of Berlin and the whole thing that the Berlin from today, I don't know. For me, there is not enough left from what Berlin was all about. Mm -hmm the spirit of Berlin. There was a way, you know, there was a, a tournoi d'esprit, uh, you know, somebody who was typical for that in a way was Helmut Newton. He had this kind of genius, huh? When you look at the state of, of where media um, is today, um, digital media, are you slightly saddened by the fact that there's almost this demystification? I mean, good brands, I always think are quite mysterious, but yet today, Everyone's talking every second about what they're doing. You look, you look at a major CEO, he's telling you about who his next designer is, uh, how happy everyone is in the factory. I mean, do you think that this somehow sort of diminishes the very industry that we're, we're talking you know, about? Information became so easy that we are over-informed by things we are not supposed to know, who are not that uh, great to know. But that is something what never existed before. So it is too dangerous to say, no, it was better before, it wasn't better, it was just different. It's up to us to adjust to our times. The times are not supposed to adjust to our perhaps passiest taste. So you have to be careful. You like it or you don't like it. The question is, that's the way it is. You can do nothing against it. That's an evolution uh, and the evolution cannot be stopped and will not be stopped tomorrow morning. I wonder if there's a certain boredom as well when you look at major fashion corporations when you think back to some of the great people that you worked with as partners before versus we're in this era of private equity, so many companies are on the stock exchange now, is there a similar rush today as there was when you put out a collection 30 years ago? No, you, I don't even compare 30 years ago with now. Huh? Now it's all, you know, the word globalization didn't exist 30 years ago. Now it's all on a global scale. Don't, it has to be on the stock market, it has to be, you know, uh, people, the companies I work for, they have hundreds and hundreds of shops all over the world, the whole thing. So th that was not like this before. So you cannot criticize a world because you think it's better before and be part of that world what is all over the place. For me it's okay. I must be an opportunist. Uh, I can still live in my private world, but I'm not against the world of today because if you're against it, you are like Don Quixote. I don't fight windmills. Mm. And in this globalized world, is a city like the one we're in, Paris, is it, is it important not just as a center for creativity, but also as a center for making things even? It depends on what kind of uh, label you are working. Uh, what Chanel does, uh, they produce in France. This kind of thing in France, they do it pretty well. But uh, for less expensive things, the, the, the people ask for so much money that they would make things, nobody would pay that much if they would be made here. So you think provenance is still important? When you're talking about a, a label like Chanel, made in France is, is still key, or, or made in Italy? Yes, made in Italy. In Italy they are pretty good. Huh? And some of the things are made the shoes uh, for Chanel are made in Italy because in France there's nobody left for the shoes. And today, perfect labor is expensive. Beautiful craftsmanship like they can do here in terms of embroidery and things like this are expensive. But not everybody can pay that. So some people uh, are happy to get something with some glitter on it, made in India, uh, I hope not by children. Huh? If you look at Austria still, a little bit of Switzerland, Germany, you still have this culture of the apprentice. People yeah. do apprenticeships. We've sort of lost this. Um, you have to have a degree, you have to go to university. The idea of doing something with your hands has kind of gone. But yeah, you, you still get this practicant culture in, in Germany. I mean, being a carpenter, if you do beautiful work, there is something to be proud of. It's like the, the medieval corporations from six, seven hundred years ago. That maybe uh, there's something left in the mind of the people. Those things never have existed in more modern and recent countries like Canada and America had never existed. Huh? New York may be more exciting than Paris, huh? but Paris is a good platform for showing fashion. Do we see rise of somewhere else becoming more important in, in the world? Or Not or in the ten next years, perhaps. Huh? Later, I don't know. I'm sure that China is ambitious to, uh, to become something like that. 
Japan has some fashion identity, but the strongest part of the Japanese fashion identity is shown in Europe. Mm. The, the, the Tokyo Fashion Week, I don't know what's very strong or not strong there. New York has an identity, but it's not as established as uh, uh, Paris. Uh, London is known for creativity, but not for business. In Italy, I don't think it's that bad. Huh? I mean, uh, I, I look, since uh, uh, Fendi was bought by LVMH, I mean, they really do unbelievably well. Like, uh, I mean, Prada, they do very well. I mean, Mutra Prada, there are not 200 Mutra Pradas in the world. Huh? You mentioned Fendi. You wear multiple hats, working for multiple brands. You speak to many companies today. They say the creative director, the creative force behind a company needs to focus. And yet you are able to send for your own collection a variety of other collections down the catwalk. It's all very different. Of course it is. And I'm wondering, how, how does that look when you sit down to, to sketch, to collaborate with your colleagues on this? That what is the vision and is it very sort of contained and is it a discussion with Monsieur Arnaud's team as to what you might have done for a Fendi collection versus yeah, what's going to then come may down I, with the Cowboys? I say you know? something horrible. I don't discuss. I do what I feel. That's not horrible. <laughs> exactly. I'm lucky it's that a I can privilege. do what I want. So uh, I was never questioned and I don't make meetings. There is no marketing meeting. I, I, I don't do those things. Huh? You know, my thing in life is the general opinion of a single person. But before I open the mouth, I vaguely think about what I want to do. And apparently, seeing the numbers, my advice is not that bad. Most of them, when they didn't listen to my uh, advice, uh, especially in the past from London, when they thought they knew better and things like that, they all had trouble. So I don't want to be pretentious, but maybe I'm not that bad. Yet, in a drive for bigger margins, it is amazing how many designers do get pushed around now who have to have focus groups, uh, who have to listen to what Wall Street says, uh, etc. Poor boys or poor girls. I mean, it never happened to me, and I hope it will never happen. Huh? I was never headhunted because my head was never free. I invented a kind of blueprint for the free lunch job the way it is. Huh? Because, you know, I have no exclusivity with nobody. Huh? Not with nobody. No, 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 no. But I'm honest enough not to do the same thing for somebody else. Because a label and a company is a company. I have no ego problem. Chanel is Chanel, Fendi is Fendi, Lagerfeld is Lagerfeld. They are totally unrelated. And if it wouldn't be like this, it would be very dishonest uh, as a job because it's not me, it's them. Do you think that's a bit of a end, end of a line right now that you are in this position of supremacy, Mr. Lagerfeld, that you'll be able to, to do this? but. The next people who come along, yeah, I mean, they're, they have to answer to a board. They have to it's up to them to impose them. I don't know. Uh, I made never an effort to impose myself. It happened like this. I wasn't questioned. I don't know why. I think it's the top of luxury. Yeah? I would be bored to death and stop. When I started Chanel, I made two ready to wear and two high fashion collection. Now I make eight. And most of them were initiated by me. The cruise was unimportant. We made it really an important event out of it. Now, every uh, two months, because there are six collections, the pre-collection and the main collection, they are, and they do the same kind of business. There are every two months a collection that the, sh uh, the shops, the windows, every, the, everything can be changed. And it's me who initiated that. Don't, uh, it's not even because uh, a sense of business. It's because I thought it was just right for that brand, Basta. Are there certain places that inspire you, where you see the next generation inspire, coming from? I don't know, but my favorite collection last season was the one the young Anderson did for, for Löwe. So I think he's great. So there are new people. Huh? Huh? And some of them are less pretentious than the generation before, what I call the former young designers. Huh? They should be nameless. No, no name, because you know as well as I do, so I don't have to give you names. No, and there is a young French boy called uh, Jacques Mus. I think he has something too. Uh, uh, no, no, there, uh, I see a lot of people, and uh, uh, Simone Rochat, I think she's very gifted. Are we at a point right now where you've done all of the projects, you've designed all the types of collections, the yachts, the cars, built the houses that you've wanted to, to build? My only regret is that I didn't do the house with Tadio Ando, that is, that is, I really regret. The rest, I did what I wanted to do, and even in a way more than I expected I could do, but you know, I'm never pleased with myself. Uh, 
I always think I could do better, I could make an effort, I'm lazy, I, I mean, it's ridiculous, I know. But I had a healthy attitude and I don't think I should s change my state of mind because when people start to think about their past, uh, their art and all that, that's very dangerous. I do a kind of applied art, don't be too pretentious. And the good thing is that I get never, like the old Rolling Stone song, I, uh, sat any satisfaction of what I'm doing. I always think it could improve. I could do better and I could do more. That's ridiculous, but it's very healthy, I think. Thank you, sir.